Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we have a Neville Goddard lecture dealing with one of the more interesting portions of the Bible in a chapter of Luke where they talk about the clever rascal, the unjust steward. I've always thought that the particular story of the unjust steward was quite unusual and it didn't make sense. Here Neville explains what it means and how it relates to revision, also providing a variety of new stories and examples. The Clever Rascal, The Unjust Steward, delivered on May 5th, 1964. Tonight's subject is The Clever Rascal. This is taken from the 16th chapter of the book of Luke. There's a story there of an unjust steward. There's a very rich man who had a steward and charges were brought against the steward that he was wasting his man's goods. So he called the steward and told him to turn in his stewardship for he could no longer represent him. The steward went out and got all the debtors and asked each in turn what they owed his master. The first one said, 100 measures of oil. He said, sit down and write quickly 50 measures of oil. Then he said to the second, how much do you owe my master? He said, 100 measures of wheat. You sit down and you write 80. So he falsified the entire record of his master, making friends for himself. For he felt, I am too weak to work and too proud to beg. And so by doing this, I'll make these friends of mine. So when I'm fired from my job, they will know that they are in my debt. For I gave this one 50% of what he really owed and that one 20% of what he owed. And so at least to this extent, they are indebted to me. When his master heard what he had done, the master highly commended him for his prudence. Then he said to those to whom he told the story, make for yourself friends of the unrighteous mammon. For if you are not faithful to the unrighteous mammon, who will trust you when it comes to the real riches of the world? Now, a parable has a central jet of truth and the outer story is secondary to its meaning. What it really tries to convey, he is not recommending the man who stole his master's goods or falsified the master's records. It's a story. What is its meaning? That's the important thing. And what are the real riches against the so-called riches of the unrighteous mammon? Well, the Encyclopedia Britannica defines for us the word righteous as equitable, just, right thinking. Therefore, unrighteous would be the opposite. It would not be just. It would be unjust. It would not be right thinking, just the opposite of right thinking. Now, what is right thinking? If today I reflect on the activities of the day and I have 100% recall, I would have a perfect record of what happened today. If I had a perfect recall that when we had dinner, for instance, I should not only know what I ate, but the order in which I ate it, the chronological order, did I take this piece before that? Did I take a sip of coffee with the meal or after the meal? Everything in the day, the mail as I received it, as I opened it, not only as I opened it, my reactions to the mail. Everything should be perfectly recalled if my memory is perfect and I have 100% recall. So the memory is the conservative aspect of imagining. So I recall the day. That is right thinking. That's righteous mammon. But I don't like what happened today, and I'm invited to emulate the unjust steward and simply recall the day and simply revise every little aspect of the day that does not conform to the day as I wish I had encountered. That is being unjust. That is right thinking. I'm completely changing and modifying the whole day to make it conform to my wish fulfilled. I'm invited to emulate the behavior of the unjust steward. For if I do not do it in this way, if I'm not faithful to this unrighteous mammon, who will trust me with that which is real in this world? Now, what is the real in this world? He is telling us by that statement, this whole vast world would be really unreal. But I am learning to cut my mental teeth and spiritual teeth on the unreality, getting a home when I can't afford it, 
increasing my income when I seemingly haven't the talent, bringing in all kinds of things in my world. But this is a world that wears out. It wears out like a garment, and the whole vast world, including the stars, they are fading and dissolving just like smoke. But there is a real world, and if I can't be faithful in this world with unjust righteous mammon, who would entrust me with the real riches of the world? Now, 16 years ago, I had an experience which I recorded in one of my books called Awakened Imagination. I've only seen it once in print, and it came after my experience. That is, it was printed thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago, but I did not know of this book. It was given to me after I came out in print and I told my story. The book is the apocryphal New Testament as compiled by James, and in it is a story told by Joseph, the father of Jesus Christ. As told in this story, Joseph had this strange experience the night of his birth, where everything stood still. The heavens stood still, the shepherds walking walked not, and the little lambs drinking drank not, and the water flowing flowed not. Everything stood still, then all of a sudden everything moved on its course. Well, that experience was mine 16 years ago, when suddenly I slipped in time and went back in time, say 200 years, and came upon a scene of a wonderful, lovely, gracious dining room. It was in the eastern section of this country. I could tell from their clothes, from the setting, everything was simply New England. Then at that moment, I knew that if I could arrest within me an activity which I felt that all that I now perceived within the focus of my vision would stand still, it would all freeze. And so at that moment, I arrested it, and my head gelled. It became solid. At that moment, I, the perceiver, I was awake, and I could change my attention, but within the focus of my vision, everything froze. The diners who were dining dined out. One young lad, about 22 years old, bringing a spoon to his mouth, froze, and he couldn't move it one moment beyond where I froze him. Father and mother on both sides, and his brother to my, his brother back to me, so the two boys and the father and the mother. A waitress coming through the door, and as she started walking, she froze and she couldn't move. A bird in flight, it froze. The little leaves falling, they froze. The grass waving with the wind, it froze. Everything froze. I examined the whole thing. It was all dead. The life was in me. And when I released that power within me, that life in me, then everything continued on its course. The boy completed his action of bringing the soup to his mouth. The waitress completed her action of walking to the table to bring the second course. The bird that was arrested in flight continued in its flight, and the leaves falling fell. Everything moved as it intended when I arrested the intention. But across the country, I'm always asked, did the four diners and the waitress, were they aware of being frozen? But I have no way of telling. I couldn't answer. I only know that I froze it in myself. I couldn't tell whether these four and the waitress walking towards the table were aware that they were frozen. I didn't know. From here to New York City and across the country, I gave lectures in Milwaukee, Detroit, Chicago, and all over San Francisco, all the way down. I've told the story, and someone would always ask that question. And I was unable from experience to answer and to tell that I know that they were dead. I thought they were all dead. I looked at them. They were dead. The bird should have fallen. If our law of gravity is true, the bird should have fallen for the bird in flight. If arrested, would fall to the ground, but it didn't. It was simply arrested. Space was frozen. Everything was frozen, so it couldn't fall. But I could not answer their question intelligently. Well, this past week, a lady who was present here tonight told me this story. It only happened to her recently. She lives in the Palisades and she hears the ocean and can see the ocean. These are her words. She said, Neville, I had this experience, but it was from the negative side of yours. You were the operant power. You stopped it. I didn't stop it. I was on the negative side. I was stopped. Suddenly someone or something turned me off, and I was nothing but literally nothing. She was aware because she could not know she was nothing unless she was aware of being nothing. 
They turned me off and I was nothing. There was no sound of the ocean, but nothing. Everything was dead. Then whatever turned me off turned me on again, and then everything became alive. Now that's the power that I call the real riches of the world. So if you're not faithful to the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with the real riches of the world, you think about it. If this very moment some tyrant in the world who wants to conquer, say, this marvelous land of ours and enslave it for their own personal gain, if they had such riches and did not have the heart of love, they could turn us off. And then that's like simply wiping off the slate, wiping off the blackboard and then rewriting the script as they would intend. Then, when they turned us on again, our intentions would be completely changed, even if that intention was to walk willingly and think we were initiating the urge to walk into the ocean beyond our depth. We would think this is what we want to do, like the lemmings do. Do they not, by the hundreds of thousands, just move toward the ocean and all become well, they all commit suicide? They do it year after year as they seemingly reproduce so many. Then suddenly, they all start moving these little animals and move toward the ocean and all commit suicide. Who turned them off and then turned them on with a different intention? Instead of reproducing themselves, the slate was wiped clean and then a new script was put on it and then the lights turned on once more. Now listen to the words, In him was life and the life was the light of men. John 1 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. We go now to the epistle. This is 1 John. That is, I just quoted from the first chapter of John. We go now to the first epistle of John. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. 5 12. If you have the Son, you have eternal life in yourself. Life in yourself is the light in men, and you can turn it off and turn it on. But I doubt that anyone could ever have life in themselves until he is embraced and fused with love, for what would he do to this fantastic world if he had life in himself not moved and guided by love? Can you conceive what man could do to turn off as the lady was turned off and everything stood still? There was no ocean. She can hear it from her window, from her home. She can see it from her home, but it was all still. There was no ocean. The ocean was simply frozen as though, well, a lake frozen. It was just simply still, the atmosphere still. And she said in her own words, I was nothing but literally nothing. She was aware of being nothing. And then someone or something, whoever turned her off, turned her on again. And suddenly she became someone, became something. Well, I had the positive side of that experience, so I can say to this lady, you are on the verge of moving from that side to the positive side. You have to have the negative side first. It's only God, the operant power operating on himself, and it's God, her own wonderful being operating on himself in her. So it was he who turned off what he loves more than anything else in the world, his emanation, which is this lady. She is his emanation, his love, and he will not in eternity leave her until they cleave and become one flesh, one being. So he operates upon her and shows her the power that he intends one day to share with her when they become one. That power she will then exercise and you will turn it off or turn it on. So then Blake said, eternity exists in all things in eternity, independent of creation, which was an act of mercy. So now you put yourself into this mind that everything is aware of being, but everything, and it is simply an act of mercy that now turns the light on and animates it, activates it, and then through the activation brings out what he loves more than anything in the world, brings out himself, his own emanation. Haven't you seen these ships up in San Francisco? As you go from San Francisco and take a ride into Sacramento, and they're all in the mothballs, Hundreds and hundreds of ships deactivated, dead, completely dead. They could tomorrow, if the order were given, be activated and once more become alive. People would go aboard. Things would come aboard. All things begin to move. These ships, thousands of them, all in mothballs. Blake saw these and he called them the halls of loss. 
He implies that everything is now. The Bible tells us that the third chapter, the 15th verse of the book of Ecclesiastes, that which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God is seeking that which is lost or which has gone astray. What has gone astray? He sent himself into the entire structure and he is extracting himself, his creative power. His creative power is called in scripture, Christ Jesus. Christ is defined in scripture as the creative power and wisdom of God. It's the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 24. Now listen to this carefully taken from the book of Proverbs, the eighth chapter. God created me at the beginning of his way, the first of his acts of old. Verse 22. Before he brought forth the heavens, before he brought forth the earth, before he established anything, I was beside him like a little child. Verse 30. Now this little statement, like a little child, the King James Version takes the same word, one single Hebrew word, and all scholars have put it into a phrase, I was beside him, like a little child, is the Revised Standard Version. The King James Version takes that same word, a single word, and gives it this interpretation, I was brought forth, I was brought forth by him. Can you imagine that? Here he doesn't say, what was brought forth, I was brought forth by him. The English Revised Version gives a still different interpretation of the single word. I'll tell you what the word is, the single word that means faith, which is called Amen. Aleph, Mem, Nun, is the word translated as I was beside him like a little child. So you go to your concordance and you look it up and it says simply faith moving to the right hand of God, not moved to the right hand. What did he bring forth, first of all, in the world? He brought forth faith. I encourage you to use the unrighteous mammon, that is faith. As you exercise your right, your talent to rearrange and falsify the record of the day and make tomorrow conform to the falsified record of tonight. So tomorrow is not the record of today. It conforms to the falsified record. You can only do it by faith. And then one day you'll be born. Who is born? Faith is born. He's called Jesus Christ. Born of whom? Born of God. Well, did you give him birth? Yes, I gave him birth. Well, then who am I? That's what you ask yourself. So you're told in the third chapter, the 16th verse of the book of Galatians, that man must give birth to Christ and that the promise was made unto Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say offsprings, referring to many, but to offspring, referring to one and to your offspring, which is Christ. So Christ is the creative power and the wisdom of God, summarized in one little thing called Amen. It stands beside him in the very beginning. So man is put into these wheels that are already completed. Everything is. Eternity exists and all things in eternity, independent of creation, which was an act of mercy. Blake, Last Judgment, page 614. So man is inserted into a wheel, and there are wheels within wheels. And may I tell you, there is no moral order in this world, only an order of nature to which both man and beast are subjected. So let no one tell you there is a moral order in this world. We are subjected to futility, as told us in the 8th of Romans. The creature was made subject unto futility, not willingly, but by the will of him who subjected him in faith. Why? He was subjected in hope that this creature that is so subjected will once more be extracted and be set free from this world of corruption and become once more a child of God, the child being his creative power where he increases his capacity to create by the experience of inserting himself in this world of futility. So everything is. There isn't a thing that is impossible to God because the whole thing is done. Every man in this world, no matter who he is, he can be any kind of man he wants to be in the world because he is all that is his potential. He now can select the kind of a man that he would like to be, although at the moment when he selects the kind of man that he would like to be, reason tells him that he could never be it. Forget what reason tells you and exercise faith and become now faithful to the unrighteous mammon. Simply represent yourself to yourself as the man 
that you want to be and be faithful to it. Now let me tell you a little story. We have a pine tree in front of our house. The last two days, the gusts of wind, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, right? Not more than, say, six feet from my eye on a little branch, doves are nesting. Well, I've been watching them. Branch above is banging one of these two doves all through the day from above. One from below is knocking the tree out. Sometimes it goes up, seemingly five or six feet. But whoever is nesting is sitting on that nest in spite of the blows. And the other one, the mate, whether it be male or female, brings a worm and feeds the one on that nest. You would think the impulse of a bird when they get a worm is to swallow it. No, it has a mission. The mission is not to swallow, but to bring to the mate who is hatching out something. This is a world for hatching. As it was revealed to me so clearly, the whole vast world is for hatching out. And you do it through faith. So she with all the blows, or he with all the blows on his little head, and all the bouncing all over the place for these little gusts have been fantastic in the last 48 hours. It still hugs that little nest, regardless of all the blows and all the wind. There it is in faith that what is keeping warm is going to come out. Now in the book of Habakkuk, the vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. If it be long, then wait, for it is sure and it will not be late. Two, three. Not late for the idea how long it takes a little dove to hatch out an egg. I don't know, a chicken? All right, 21 days. A little sheep, five months. A horse, 12 months. A man, nine months. So we have different time intervals for hatching out. But at length for hatching ripe, he breaks the shell. So you hatch out. You're the dove. You're hatching out something. And if it doesn't work by tomorrow, so what? Regardless of the blows of the day. So this little beast, this little dove, here it is sitting on a nest. And these terrific blows on top of it, I can see it. I look outside and here is the thing coming on the little bird. And then something comes from below. And then its own little branch is flying all over the place, but it doesn't leave that little purpose. Its purpose is to hatch out. Well, we are the dove. We are this Holy Spirit that is God. We conceive an idea that seemingly is impossible. And so we too form our little nest. Our nest is simply to assume that we are what we now we want to be and we do assume it that mentally we are seeing the fulfilled desire see it reflected in the faces of our friends see it reflected in society see it reflected the whole vast world over and regardless of the blows of the day regardless of the gusts that come the rumors that come we simply hang on to what we are hatching out not a power in this world is going to stop it. It will come out one after the other. We bring them to this world of ours. Then if we are faithful with this unrighteous mammon, the day will come. We will receive the Son. He who has the Son has eternal life in himself. He who has not the Son has not eternal life. But let us first prove ourselves faithful with the unrighteous mammon. And then will come the day we'll be given the power to stop and start what is forever, for all this is forever. All these are the characters of God's world. You are not anything that you are now wearing. You are the wearer, the actor. God only acts and is in all existing beings and men. The actor is God. The costume, all right, call it Hamlet, call it Neville, call it John, call it any other name in this world. All these are the characters that God created. They're almost, you could call them resultant states of his first creative act. And then he buried himself in these costumes and plays the parts. Let no one tell you there's any moral order in this world. There's only an order of nature to which the whole vast world of man and beast and birds and animals and everything else are subjected they're all subject to it. Then he has to bring forth the first inkling which God brought forth, and that is faith. I'm the first of his acts of old, 
Before he brought forth the universe, I stood before him as a little child. And the word translated as a little child, I stood beside him as a little child, is Amen. The Hebrew word Amen simply means faith. In its essence, that's Amen. So he brings it forth first by the faith he created the universe. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. By faith, we understand that the world has created by the word of God, so that the things that are seen were made from things that do not appear. Verse 3. All from the invisible reality. So you simply single out the man, the woman, that you want to be and assume that you are it regardless of what the world will tell you. Then live faithful to this unrighteous mammon. Because reason tells you that you are not, and memory tells you that you've never experienced this, so you are falsifying the record. But we are encouraged to falsify the record. You read it carefully, the 16th chapter of the book of Luke. And so the rich man called his steward and highly commended him for what he had done by falsifying the record to make friends for himself of the unrighteous mammon. Well, the word steward originally meant a ward of the sty. In other words, a keeper of the pig. The pig has always been the symbol of the Redeemer and the Savior of the world. So the keeper of the Savior of the world. Well, who is the Savior of the world? We're told in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior, verses 311. So if I am the keeper, if I am the steward of the sty, the steward of the mystery of God, the Savior of this world, and he tells me, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, that I am the keeper of the Savior, and he is my own, I am. If all things are possible to God, now start on this level and then serve faithfully the unrighteous mammon. Just try it. Righteousness is right thinking. Unrighteousness is seemingly wrong thinking. I am not faithful to the record, but I will not be faithful to the record. I'll change it. If I am faithful to the record, I am simply not competent forever and forever and forever. The purpose is to make me a creator like my father. He creates. I can't create. If I can only observe automatically that which passes before me. So nothing passes away. The past hasn't really passed. I slipped into it and have slipped into it 200 years ago, it is still taking place. The diners who dined 200 years ago are still at that very moment in time dining. This moment is taking place and will forever take place. It cannot pass away. This little building will go. You and I will make our exit from this world. But this moment in time is clothed as it is now clothed and cannot pass away. The building will go, certainly bigger buildings will come here, and you and I will make our exit from the scene. But the scene is caught in time, and that section of time is forever, and you can't take it away. Tomorrow, in which we think we go, it is taking place, it is not going to be created, it is all done. Read it carefully in the third chapter, the 15th verse of Ecclesiastes, that which is already has been, that which is to be already has been. And there is nothing new under the sun. It is all here. And you and I only become aware of increasing portions of that which already is. So becoming aware of it is simply change it. I know it is taking place and we are automatons until we practice this wonderful art of falsifying the record. I call it revision. The Bible doesn't use the word revision, but I try to make it more understandable to our section as it were. They speak of it as repentance. Repentance is a radical change of attitude towards life, but a radical change. Well, if today I reflect on the day, and my recall is fairly good, if I recall the day and a portion of the day is not a very pleasant thing, well then, at the moment of recall, change it. I'm saying to someone, what do you owe my Lord? My Lord is my own consciousness. Well, I owe him so much. Well, then sit down quickly and modify it. You don't owe him that much at all. Make it 50%. And how much do you owe? 100%. Well, make it 80%. There are certain things in my life that I can't possibly change more than 50. You meet a man with one foot missing and you know in eternity he hasn't a foot that is missing. But at the moment, you can't bring yourself to believe the foot is going to grow. So you can't forgive him 100%. 
but you can modify it and say, in spite of the handicap of a foot gone or an eye gone, he still can be successful and happy and in love and being loved in this world. So the absence of a foot doesn't make any difference. So you can modify it to a certain degree. There is not a thing in this world you can't bring down to some degree so in one case he gave it 50% in another case he gave it 20% but you can take everything in this world and to some degree improve it by lopping off some little portion of it if only 5% and so at the end of the day take your day bring it into your mind's eye try to get it as perfect a recall as possible and then play the part of the unjust steward then forgive it completely forgive it that's not so-and-so, so-and-so happened. And may I tell you, it works like a charm, just a charm. Here's a simple little thing. My brothers are great humorists. I think they are. So they were late in sending me my check. I'm 5,000 miles away. So they say, oh, well, Neville doesn't care, forget it. So after all, it is my money. I have a portion of the stock. They should have held a board meeting five months ago for the fiscal year closed at the end of September of last year so certainly after the closing of the business the end of september they should have decided what kind of dividends they were going to pay well they didn't they have all the money they need and they take it for granted that i have all the money that i need so forget him he's five thousand miles away and he can't complain and if he does so what does it matter we are too remote to even respond to his complaint then finally my brother victor became aware well after all we shouldn't do this to Neville, so we will simply send him a check. So he sent me a very lovely big check last Saturday, but he had to get his little humorous note into it. He dictates this letter to his secretary, mind you, of all the people in the world, and then here comes this letter with the check enclosed, and he said, because of your dire need, I'm sending this check off to you, this draft. So a friend of mine, only a week before how God works, only a week before a friend of mine who works for RCA, and he always puts into the mail almost daily some little thing that the salesmen bring him. It's a choice little morsel. He mimeographs it or has it photographed, and then he makes multiple numbers of it and sends to his friends. Well, this one that he sent me was a man standing at a bar with a huge big mug of ale, a bulbous nose and no pants. And here he is, a picture of him with a big smile on his face, holding this huge thing in his hand, and no pants on him, and the caption of it is, Good heavens, I've forgotten my wallet. So I took this and I wrote my brother on this little note, a thank you note, and told him he must be psychic. He must be psychic because I didn't get my wallet, and now he's filled it for me. See, all these little things, I never would have thought of such a thing, but my friend sent it only a week ago. Usually you read it, you laugh, and you tear it up and throw it away, but for some reason or other I kept it. I kept it as a little piece of paper on which I could answer my brother and thank him for filling my wallet for me. So you see, let us falsify the record. The whole vast world is for one purpose, for hatching out. It's for really, this is an educative darkness. And the purpose of life here in this world is simply to exercise our talent, which is God, our own wonderful human imagination, and simply learn the art of image making. The art of image making, you simply, well, what do I want in this world? Not only for myself, but for my friends. Well, they may not even want it, but you think it's lovely. Want it for them? It's a lovely gift. No one returns it. If the gift is unlovely, they should return it. And you who offered the gift will be stuck with it. But it's a loving gift. And should they stupidly return it, you would not be unwilling to accept it, you the giver. Therefore, give only the loving things in this world. And be just like the little dove that is now being pummeled from above and below and all over the place. But she and he are faithful. They're being fed. Are we not told? Are you not more worthy and you are worth more than five sparrows? And not a sparrow falls, but your father knows it. Are you not of more value than the sparrows? Well, the little dove is being fed. Whether it be the male or female, they don't get off the nest. Whoever is there, the other one brings food and gives it. And they remain faithful to their purpose, which is to warm and to hatch out the little egg. 
and of all the birds I know of, the dove is the most careless in the making of a nest. They don't make good nests. They almost drop the egg on a piece of leaf. They expect in some strange way other birds will build a nest and do it beautifully, but not a dove. That's why they use the symbol of a dove to descend upon man, the one he loves, the one who has his favor, and to smother him with kisses because he brought forth Jesus Christ. He brought forth the symbol of his faith, for Jesus Christ is faith. That is the word Amen, who stood beside him in the very beginning because he couldn't make a world without faith. We understand that by faith the world was created by the word of God. So he had to first bring forth faith. And so everyone must bring forth the child, the Christ child, and the Christ child is your faith. Therefore, when you are born from above, it is symbolized in the little infant wrapped in swaddling clothes, which is Jesus Christ. You bring him forth, symbolizing your faith. At the end of each lecture, Neville would give two minutes of silence, followed by question and answers, as we will do here. Now, let us go into the silence. Question, how do you get that faith? Answer, sir, how do you get that faith? That is a marvelous question. He said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Mark 9, 24. Believe in the reality of your imaginal act. It's an imaginal act that is the egg that you really drop. Warm it and keep it aglow to the best of your ability. So I call faith loyalty to unseen reality. To me, it's a good definition of faith because when a man says he is loyal, he says, I'll take this woman to be my wife. Well, the pledge is through thick or thin. You just have to protect her. Well, you must be loyal to the best of your ability to that pledge. And she makes a similar pledge. So loyalty is a marvelous world, loyal to our country that no one should be able to take any one of us as Americans and drive us to betray our country. So you're loyal. I mean, you're beyond it. No one could even approach you if you're loyal to the country. You don't have to fight for it to defend it with words and these things. You're loyal to your country. You're feeling about it. Well, you're loyal to an idea. You assume that you are or that a friend is what you would like to be or what you would like him to be, and then you remain loyal to the unseen reality until the unseen becomes seen. It will if you are as loyal to it 
as that little tender bird this night is loyal to her duty, which is to bring what she is sitting on out into an animated world. So practice, practice, and still more practice. Any other questions, please? Question, in reference to the pig being the symbol of the Savior, how does this then relate to the prodigal when he is eating with the pigs? Answer, did you hear that question? The pig is the symbol. You can find it in any great book of symbolism, has always been the Savior, the Redeemer of the world, the symbol of it. The prodigal went prodigal, spent all of his money, and he was feeding the pig. That was his last job, and eating the food that belonged to the pig. He was really a steward in the extreme sense of the word to share with you, Tom, for you haven't been here since I had this experience. A few years ago, I had this vision. I found myself one night fully awake in an enormous display of flowers and plant life. It was closing time dusk and I was alone and I knew that everyone had gone from the place and it would not be open for a little while. And so I must be going too. Just as I started toward the exit, I saw a little pig, a little runt, a small little fellow, but perfectly healthy, but very, very small. I said to myself, I can't leave him here unfed, unwatered. I must do something about it. So there was a table maybe the height of this. And I took branches and I took flowers and I took all the green things that I could find and I made a little bed for him. Then I said, if he gets hungry enough, he will eat of the flowers. They may not be the best kind of food to feed him, but he will still survive until someone finds him. And so then, as I did the best I could with what I had as flowers and leaves and so on, then the thing changed suddenly like a turning over a leaf, and I found myself in an enormous supermarket, every conceivable kind of food displayed. In the supermarket, my brother Victor, who runs all of our businesses, he was there, my daughter Vicky, she was there. Suddenly I looked down, and here is the pig. But the pig had grown about four or five times its size since I last saw it. But it was rangy, it was thin, and obviously not well fed. Should have been better fed in the interval between the discovery of the pig and the present moment of the pig. So I went right away and I got a bag of meal and I started to mix it with water. My brother Victor came by and he said, What are you doing? I said, I'm mixing some food for my pig. So he had a bag and from the bag he took three or four handfuls of very thick white gravy and he gave substance to the meal. I thanked him for adding substance to it, but I knew it would take me quite a while to mix it so that the pig could eat it. So I said to my daughter Vicky, I said, go over there and bring me a little package of crackers. She said, Daddy, what will I use for money? I said, you don't need any money. All of this belongs to us. Everything here is ours. So ask no one any favor. Just go and take it. Well, there was a huge pyramid of crackers. And she, instead of taking one from the top, took one from the bottom and dislodged. The whole thing fell as she took it. It exposed a little light, a little single four or five inch candle that was lit. I said to her, don't touch it and don't build the pyramid anymore. That's my light. It must never in eternity be put out. The candle now shines upon my head and by light I walk through darkness for the light of man. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord and that's my candle. So don't build it and conceal it anymore. And with that it all dissolved. So between finding the symbol of the savior of the world, which was a pig, and then the interval afterwards he had grown but he should have been fed by me better than I had fed him. I did not take every opportunity that was presented to me in the course of that interval to feed him. Well, when do you feed him? Every time you exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of another, you've done it unto me. And so where's the glass of water? When you did not imagine something lovely about another, I was thirsty and you didn't give me a glass of water. When you did not imagine something lovely, I was in need of shelter, and you didn't take me in. I was in need of raiment, and you didn't take me in. So every time an individual exercises his imagination lovingly on behalf of anyone in this world, he is feeding the pig. Good night. And that concludes The Clever Rascal, The Unjust Steward. I never understood that story at understand it a little bit more now. I still think it's not the best story to give an example of revision because in it, it's a contradiction 
in the Bible, for me, when I first read it, I was like, well, he's lying. And isn't one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie. But that was how I always used to read the Bible. I would look for contradictions. And when you get the Neville perspective of the Bible, it opens up a new interpretation of that particular passage. Revision is by far the most powerful thing for me personally that I have used with Neville. Obviously, the law of assumption is powerful, but you're using the law of assumption with revision. It is a sort of time travel, a way to go back and change your day. And when you do it on a regular basis, when you revise things that didn't go right, perhaps you had a post on Facebook, or you had a letter that came in the mail, or something that turned out badly, well, you can just go back and revise it. And revision is a very, very powerful way to deal with a particular problem. There is a wonderful lecture where Neville talks about a woman who can't see very well. She had been in a car accident and she goes and imagines not being in the accident, driving around the accident. And then her vision slowly becomes better and better. And then she doesn't need glasses anymore. There are a bunch of examples of revision that are really powerful. And I would love for you to share some of them in the comments below. Have you revised anything? Did it work? It is wonderful to go back through the Bible and every time they talk about repentance, it's actually revision. Repentance always had this very negative connotation like you are guilty and you better admit it and you better come to God and admit that guilt. And it's not about that. He's saying it's not a moral thing. You are revising when you are repenting. His story of the dove is very powerful. That is what's going on when you're properly imagining and creating your reality. The winds are going to hit you from above and below. You're going to see things that don't match with your reality, but you just keep the faith and you stick with it. And it's hard. It's not something that everybody can do, or obviously the world would be different. But when you learn this and you treat it like an art and you get better and better at it, your imaginal acts can be revised and Whatever you imagine will come about if you keep the faith and continue imagining, staying on that branch and warming that egg so that it can hatch. Thank you as always. And I'm imagining the most wonderful day for you. And I'm going back to revise all the things that I've seen in the world and saying they didn't. And I'm seeing stuff on TV. I'm, I'm going to revise it. There's so much that we can revise. There's so much that we can imagine for this world. And when we come into our power, we will change the world with our imaginings. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Check out the playlist for Neville Goddard where you can find all of the Neville Goddard content. And there is so much that we've now compiled. There is so much. And it seemingly every lecture offers something new. We're always learning something new and it is such a joy to read these lectures, to come back to this material and really learn about the Bible in many ways and my own spirituality and a greater understanding of the power I have to create my reality. So thank you very much. It is always an honor to read these lectures to you. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.